believe. And uh, welcome in uh, to everyone uh, watching on Facebook while Joey plays with the uh, teenagers on Instagram to try and get that working. Um, someone said yes. Oh, Joey. Um, welcome to Sydney Whiskey Forum Night 9. And that sort of sums up how things are going, I reckon, today. Um, oh, yep, a bit, fine, of, uh, a bit of things falling over. Um, but thank you for, uh, for tuning in uh, to from wherever you are uh, on the Facebook, on the Instagram, or at whiskeyfair.com.au slash forum. Um, great pleasure to welcome you. This is a bit of an impromptu one, Joey, because we had initially intended for this to be uh, the launch of our Ben React single cask, which I have it on very good authority, is clearing customs as we speak, is likely to be in store uh, probably early next week. Um, looking at Monday, which means once once that is there and confirmed, we will have a bit of a chat um, with the distillery in Scotland and get them organised for a reschedule uh, of the of the virtual tasting. But we want to make sure that everyone's got a bottle um, of that of that rum cask uh, from Ben React that we've uh, got coming in. So that's why we've delayed that one a little bit. But Joey, thankfully you were around and could jump on for the comeback, the comeback that no one asked for, the comeback that no one wanted and probably no one even expected. Uh, the comeback of Oak Barrel After Hours, episode 31 or thereabouts. I don't know who's keeping score. Yeah, what a, what a time to, to revive the, the uh, Oak Barrel After Hours. Um, right in the, in the tail end of, of Sydney Whiskey Forum, um, a series of nights that I have thoroughly enjoyed. And yeah, I got invited back after such a stellar performance on Friday night. It was uh, it's interesting talking to uh, Milne, who was part of the Whiskey Roundtable last night. It was, he's uh, had to do some stuff during the week, so um, couldn't listen to everything live, but uh, was saying was looking forward to going back to, to listening to the blind tasting. Uh, he's had enough of uh, Matt Bailey, but he's interested to see how you sort of uh, had a look at things, which uh, would have been interesting. Um, but tonight uh, we are sort of something that we're going to launch anyway, and this is what we've sort of drilled into tonight's uh, live stream is that this is going to be the official launch of the Oak Barrel's new podcast, um, which we actually just recorded before coming live here. So it won't be this as such, so we don't need to worry. This one can be a little bit crazy, a little bit weird. But, um, yeah, we've been asked to do it for well over a year now, and we've threatened to do it. We've thought about doing it. We've had some practice goes at doing it, but uh, we've actually going to have a proper stab at it this time around. Maybe get, maybe get reasonably serious put a little bit of effort in not too much obviously this is the oak barrel but maybe just a little bit of effort in yeah well i think what um you know what we when the after hours started i think we were trying to sort of get that informative you know um i mean a slightly more structured um format of, of a of a a stream or, or a live stream that sort of thing um as well as kind of bringing you know what i guess after hours was started to be which was a general sort of um chat you and I, you know, general shop talk, talking to, to people, and um, I think it, it shifted slightly towards the latter, um, seeing what mo most were enjoying, including ourselves. So we've split them up, uh, so we're going to be doing, yeah, um, a shorter, probably more, more informative, uh, more well put to, uh, more well thought out, I guess, um, well, style of, of uh, podcast, which will hopefully, in the 30 minutes or less, keep everybody up to date on what's happening in uh, the wine and whiskey here at the Oak Barrel and, and um, further about. And then I, I don't think you need to say more thought out than stuff that we've done in the past because I don't think there's been too much thought gone into after hours no. in the past. <laughs> Not really. Um, but, but yes, no, we, we're going to have a, a, a little bit of fun with, with that. So watch, I don't know where that came from, watch this space uh, for, for hopefully next week, the week after for the launch of the... Podcast, but Jay, I've done not a lot apart from uh, sit in front of a computer and talk about whiskey for the past nine nights. That's been a hell of a lot of a fun, but I don't drink during August mm. um, for, for Whiskey Fair slash Whiskey Forum this year up until the end of the month. You don't, or well, you didn't drink during July this month. Um, so I actually haven't had a drink with you for about two months um, because there's literally nothing else for us to do. Uh, there's no other reason why we would catch up. No, no, not really. And I think, yeah, I did the uh, the Dry July this year um, on a, sort of a bit of a whim, a bit of a dare of, of a friend of mine. So I went in with a, with a few mates on the pact. Um, and yeah, outside of tasting and spinning uh, wines, uh, like like I, I do for, for my job here, yeah, I fully dry. Um, got very, I got to know the, the non-range here that we carry in store, yep, which yep. is um, Melbourne-based... Uh, 
it's a wine alternative. I, I haven't been selling it as, as a non-alcoholic wine, so I don't really think that's what it is. But if anyone's familiar, it's a sort of a, a non-alcoholic uh, beverage soda. Some are brewed, some are spritzy, some are not. Really, really interesting, though. Um, I, you know, they were There was enough about those uh, bottles that I could sort of sit down and, and you know, do what I do quite regularly with, with bottles of wine, which was to sit down and study them and read about them and taste them and all that sort of thing. They were you know, complex enough and, and really interesting. Um, and then for the, the more refreshing edge, um, the sober range was a bit of a saving grace there. Um, so the pepperberry IPA, the finger lime cerveza, um, and the lemon aspen pilsner were awesome. And Big I, fan of the lemon aspen pilsner, actually. That, yeah. That got my vote this year. It was awesome. Um, and then um, I think Heaps Normal landed probably a week after July finished. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not too well versed with the Heaps Normal. Yeah, the Heaps Normal things. is, uh, hands down, got me through mm. August. Mm. Uh, excellent little non-alcoholic beer, um, you know, with a real hop structure, uh, which is something you don't find too often uh, in non-alcoholic brews, but um, you've yeah, done, done very, very well. Uh, g'day to, to Mike Leyland on the uh, on the Facebook stream as well, um, and the various people coming through on, on Instagram. But feel free to ask us any questions. Um, but one thing I want to talk about tonight um, is 2020, and tomorrow night when we go live, we will be live from the Archie Rose Distillery in Rosebury with uh, 29 very, very good friends of ours uh, for the first physical tasting the Oak has been involved in uh, were six months now, uh, for, for a yeah, long time, okay. uh, since lockdown. So I um, want a bit of a talk about that, talk about the single cask. I've got a little bit of that uh, single cask we're releasing tomorrow uh, to try in a bit as well and write some live tasty notes for that. Um, but it's been interesting. Obviously, there's a lot of want to get back to, to physical events and all that sort of thing. Um, I've enjoyed not cleaning up lots of glassware after virtual yeah. events, um, but it's it's a little bit different. So you know we've we're going into Archie Rose, and Archie Rose Distillery has two sides of it. You've got the bar side and then the distillery side as well. And with their operations moving uh, to a to a new bigger majority of their distilling operations, it's got a lot of space in it now. So we're doing tastings of thirty under COVID regulations. Uh, they could fit 73, I think it is, so 73, 75 people, so we're well under their capacity. Um, but yeah, I, I spent this afternoon getting everyone who's bought a ticket and sort of putting them into little groups, and yeah, you're going to sit with you. and <laughs> There's a cool kids there. table, and then there's like a not so cool kids table. Like, yeah, 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 but you, you don't know which one's which until no, you, you get no, there. So We um, do, though. But yeah, I was like, so who do I want to sit next to? Um, and, and that sort of stuff, and you know, yeah. ask, answering those questions or, or asking the questions of, can we have a photographer? Can a photographer get up and walk around and take photos and say, it's going to be very interesting. Um, what was the answer to that question? Uh, yes. Okay. yes. I think because we are so low down on the potential capacity, mm. uh, which is why we did that on purpose. We're doing two nights of uh, 30 people. Um, which, it means we do have a little bit of space to play with. There was, a, there was that element of it. We, don't know how, we didn't know how it was going to work. But also there was also an element of if things ramped up, you know, there was a real chance we wouldn't be... I mean, there's a real chance we wake up tomorrow. Yeah, and, and yeah, yeah. And midday ago, no, you can't do it. So, um, But that just gave us a bit of breathing room to, to play around with. Um, but it's going to be good. Looking forward to seeing some people who I've only seen uh, via names on screens for the yeah, past yeah, yeah. six months. <laughs> yeah, I reckon there's um, there's a couple of people at home gearing up for that tasting, and I think it's going to be a pretty exciting one. So. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be fun. And obviously, part of it is to launch... Um, a single cask. We release a lot of casks. Uh, we have released a lot of casks for fair over the years, and that's no different to this year. We've got three single casks um, that uh, you know we've we've purchased that are being released uh, are ready to go. Uh, one is the Tim Boone Shaggers Reserve, which we launched at um, the Distillers Dinner equivalent, the virtual Distillers Dinner last Thursday. And that was one we were sort of talking to, to Josh Walker and the team at Tim Boone about, oh, do we do it? Is there going to be an appetite for it? Do we wait? Um, but he actually had people calling him up at the distillery. No, so, really? I know fair's not happening. Is there going to be a shaggers anyway? So <laughs> uh, we, we, we did get some of that. We've launched it. It's, it's been bottled. That's that's on its way to us now. Um, a Ben Rea rum cask, a 14-year-old, um, as I mentioned earlier, that is... We should have been launching tonight, but is is sitting... Uh, I believe it is in Australia. It is... Well, the ship is docked... It's just going through the process, finding it under all the all the um, all the shipping containers and things to find the one uh, that we're looking for, uh, and then Archie Rose, which is something we've been working on for a couple of years, um, and so we're going to launch that tomorrow night, which is very very 
exciting because I think there's very few single casts that I've been involved in at the Oak Barrel that are as exciting as this one is. Yeah, I, I, I do, um, not that Scott will probably appreciate me saying this, I do kind of remember um, your sort of, I would call it almost like a, like a gallop of joy. It the was, store, yeah. Uh, upon, upon tasting this one for the first time. Um, and you know that that was that our our access and yeah it was very much a a pride filled sort of spree through uh, if you know that from the tasting room where where um, this was probably tasted to to out the front of the front till. <laughs> well, I remember the excitement that that coming coming from your eyes. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, this is the thing, and it was excitement and uh, quite a lot of relief yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. So. Normally, the way single casts would work, and we're going to delve into this a little bit deeper when it does come to launching the, uh, the Ben Reddick single cast, which is now looking like a couple of weeks, because now we're not constrained by the 10 days of forum. When it lands, we can get it out, make sure everyone's got it, so mm. those who want to join us and, and crack it uh, can, can do so. Um, we're going to have Stuart Buchanan from Ben Reddick Distillery um, talking about it, but then also um, Talita Alves, brand ambassador, and Seamus, uh, who works with Brown Foreman here as well, to have all the different angles of how this cast comes to life. But normally, in a nutshell, uh, what we would uh, get into is we go, hey, distillery, A, B, C, we would like to buy a single cask uh, off you and bottle it for the oak barrel. And they will go, no, you can't go away. And then after a lot of begging, uh, they go, okay, we're ready to sell your cask. And what would happen then is um, we would either go to the distillery. In Australia, we have that luxury. In normal years, we can go, we can sample some casks, look at what's going on. Um, for Scotland, the cask gets sent to us, and then you know we get another cask of samples. We might go through five or ten or twenty, and go, "Hey, uh, no thanks, that's nothing fits our bill. This tastes really good." Then you have conversations about price and timelines and access and that sort of thing. With Archie Rose, we've been talking about a cask for two or three years, and then sort of got we came up with this plan to do a cask and launch it for for this year, uh, and basically the. The, the way that it worked is we committed and paid before we'd actually tasted it. <laughs> Which I don't know if I'm allowed to admit. Yeah. But I knew, now, now you know. But I knew what we were getting. I tried a lot. So basically, uh, and what we're drinking tonight and what everyone else will be able to try uh, from tomorrow um, is Archie Rose uh, Rye Malt, mm. single cask R125 at 52.4%. Uh, 52 which is an oak barrel exclusive. And so what... The Archie Rose Rye Malt is essentially a Solera system, so they will throw casts in it um, and bring it down to the 46 and then draw off each batch of Archie Rose from that Solera. So all that's coming together, it never gets emptied and that uh, just topped up so that creates that consistency. So we knew that we were getting one of the casts that was going into the Solera system mm -hmm. and I knew the quality of those casts, I knew the quality of the, the product, the world knows, the, the Rye Malt is you know, won world's best rye whiskey at the World Whiskies Award earlier this year. So I knew that it was going to be good. I didn't know quite what it was going to be or which one we were looking at. Uh, so when this one came up, which I actually have a strange feeling I've tried in previous years as yeah, a bit okay. of a, you know, it's shown up at fairs around the country going, hey, this is a bit of a progress report of where we're going, which is why there's not much left in it because mm. I think a few bottles have been taken. But yeah, when DHR um, from the distillery brought the samples, I think this is the one you're looking at, and I tried it. I did go up through the store <laughs> to um, to it. But you know, out, like outside of all the fun things we get to do, and I just love how this tastes. When else are we going to get the opportunity to bottle a single cask of the world's best rye whiskey? You know, and think into the various you know whiskey awards and things as you as you will. But um, uh, yeah, I mean that that's just a really cool thing. Um, quick, quick shout out to a few people on, on the Facebook here. Uh, Andrew um, is saying this, San Diego Rye is incredible. Um, yeah, 100%. We're actually going to be mm. sampling that tomorrow night as yeah, well. That as is part amazing. Of the, part of the tasting is going, looking at all the Archie Rose Rise. Uh, and Daniel Hooper asks, evening lads, how's the pen game tonight, Scotty? And I'm... No it, pens! I'm embarrassed. <laughs> I'm ashamed. Uh, because we did just record uh, the episode, or what will become the first episode of our upcoming podcast, um, in another room, and the pen is sitting on the table in the other room as we quickly moved <laughs> things from one to the other. I forgot to grab the pen, unless it's in my pocket. No, so it's the pen game is really lacking tonight, unfortunately. You know, not the only thing that's shifted to the virtual space. Yeah. Your pen game. 
Uh, and big, big talk on the Instagram as well, eagle-eyed people, because I have just run from one side of the store to the yeah. other. And I do keep the nip of courage. It's a long way to the shop if you want a sausage roll mug at that side. Um, and then I keep the Blackgate mug uh, on this side. But because I was over there, I had this mug full. So yeah, in the dash, I've just grabbed this mug. So, I mean, it's all over the place. It is just, <laughs> it's all over the place tonight. This is what happens when we try to do two things at once. <laughs> or actually two things, one after the other. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah it falls but... apart. Um, exciting. Yeah. Very I, exciting. I just, I'm excited to be around people again and, and host a tasting. I'm excited to listen to Dave Withers talk about whiskey because we all know that that is an incredible um, experience. But I'm just, you know, more than anything, excited to show this whiskey to people. Mm. Um, so I would like maybe for you, just if you were, if this was the first time ever that you saw this or take us through your first time ever tasting this. Um, and you know what, like initial impressions, I guess, because I've, I've, I've had a few, like I've, you know, you've shown me this a few times um, since we picked it or you picked it. Um, so I've kind of got my head around it a little bit, but I like to know like what's going on in this whiskey for you. Yeah, yeah. So um, for me, first the richness on the nose, because I know like I'm, we're, we're a lot of people will be now familiar with the core range Archie Rose Rye Malt, um, but. All the stuff that we've loved in the single casks we've been lucky enough to try over the years, just that, that richness and that vibrancy. And just on the nose for me, um, straight away it was the, um, like that wood polish mm. element um, that came through. Then on the palate, just the, the coating of it, the spices there, the sweetness, but I actually am not seeing a huge amount of it straight away. Um, I'm actually seeing like a lot of other different elements. We're talking about virgin oak here as well, so there's a bit of tannin towards the end, but it's not huge. Um, then the bit that got me as I was galloping up and down uh, Beer Alley here, yelling and screaming about it, was the length and the development. It just The finish just keeps coming in waves and waves and waves. And I honestly believe, and I know I'm biased, um, and I don't care if you don't buy it because that means there's more bottles for me and there was only 106 all up, uh, and 60 of those are gone already to the people who bought uh, the 60 tickets for the two nights. But I think this is the best whiskey I've tried from Archie Rose. Yeah, okay. I like. I honestly think big that. Big call. It, it is a big call. Um, it would be in their top spirits I've tried. Because controversial opinion, I actually, out of all the stuff I've been very lucky enough to try, I don't necessarily think the Archie Rose whiskey is the best spirit they've produced yet. Mm. I do have a sample. Oh, hold on. They're releasing their single malt very soon, and I might have a sneaky sample on another desk. But okay. I, haven't, I haven't actually yeah. tried it yet, so I can't talk mm. about that one yet. But I've heard it's excellent as well. Um, but yeah, I just I just love the waves of this. I mean, mm. tell me tell me what, what you think. You, you didn't drink as much whiskey as me. You're not as emotionally involved, let's say, with this no, whiskey. No, um, I, I like I do feel like a slight like a, a, a slightly emotional involvement. I think um, as I do with every. Um, you know, cask that we've bottled since my time here, which has been some amazing whiskies. Um, but, like, this is an interesting one. So, like, I, that that wood varnish, like, you definitely get. But it, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting whiskey in the fact that I feel as though the nose is quite enticing but restrained. It's something that I sort of maybe touch on, like, a little bit when I, when I taste wines. Um... But it's, you know, not really giving away too much. Because yeah. then on the palate, like you said, that's just those waves that come through. There's like, there's this creaminess, there's this richness, there's a lot of that um, butter and spice. There's a lot of Christmas cake, but it's still quite dry. You know, it, there's, a, there's a lot going on, and, but it doesn't feel messy in any sense. No, you, no. You're like, I've tasted whiskeys and I've tasted wines especially that everything comes at once. And your palate just freaks out. You don't know what's going on. You're, oh, I'm getting this. I'm getting this. This is quite, like, in order. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. It does. Um, I mean, one of the things that is important to remember is is the rye malt is. It's not a classic American prohibition era rye. Mm. You know, the rye is malted. Um, right. Which it, which is a, a little bit different to what the American distillers. And I almost think that the the core range rye malt. It's like a rye for Australian single malt drinkers. Um, not necessarily a rye for rye drinkers. And, you know, you put this next to 
the single cask from Gospel Rye down mm. in um, uh, Victoria, that even though they're using Mallee Rye from you know the Mildura region and around there in, in Victoria, Northern Victoria, um, even though it's Aussie grain, it still tastes a lot closer to a classic rye sort of style. Yeah. So this is sort of a development of that. It's like I, I don't almost know where to put it in some points. I think I think the nose on this, um, I, I disagree a little bit on what, what you were saying there. I think it does say a lot on, so. on, on the nose, yeah. And I think because of that, it might you know be that, that breadth of that wood polish that then brings through spice mm. and things a little bit further. Um, that's me. I mean, now, and this sample's now been open mm. for a little while, um, about, about a month or so, yeah. um, this particular uh, little sample bottle. Uh, it's got further and further down, so I haven't touched it probably this week. Mm. Um, so the spice is coming through mm. a little bit. It's it's gentler. Um, but, but yeah, yeah, I love it. Like I really love. Yeah, I don't know. Like I'm, I just love that that power, that complexity, but it's not overwhelming in any sense but yeah just the layers and layers and layers and i think that's interesting because i know we've had the discussion like a few times you and i about you know i sort of came up through that that bar bar world that cocktail world or something where you know you rise maybe they get drunk neat but there is like a more often than not they're probably put into cocktails and that's where you want that big old school rye that spice you know to really kind of hold its own and show up in a drink like that not the style that, that the Archie Rose Rye is going for. But, you know, I've got a lot of time for that bottling as well. Yeah. In its own respect of just kind of, you know, breaking its own mould, I guess, into Australian rye. There was, yeah, one of the things you said there that I think is probably a term that gets used every now and again for certain whiskies and, and probably even for wine, but that velvet hammer mm. thing. Yeah, yeah. This yeah. has a lot of power, but it's incredibly elegant. Mm. Um, and it just does everything I want this whiskey to do. Yeah. Um, it did, and everything I thought, you know, I want a cask of uh, a, probably a unique version of the rye malt. Um, how can I how can I get that? And this does everything. Um, quick day to, to Mark Westmoreland from the Wolfman Distillery in Thurso on the Facebook there, getting his fair share of Aussie whiskey chat this week. Which is yes, if you <laughs> if you're stuck listening to me, mate, you've got plenty <laughs> of rubbish chat uh, about Aussie whiskey this week. Tell me if I ask what what is the dollar value for this bottling? Really enjoy Archie Rose. Be interesting getting a single barrel version. Um, Look, I, I wasn't going to talk about price because I, I don't want to. I, I think we should appreciate it for itself, and then whether it's fifty bucks or five thousand bucks, you make up your mind. Seven thousand. Seven thousand dollars a yeah. bottle. Yep, that's exactly right. Uh, no, look, we have we're going to have a very limited amount of the cask to sell come Friday. Um, you know, we're probably expecting about twenty bottles um, to be available to to the the world uh, outside of the, the launch event. Um, I'm, I think. It'll probably see it at about 189. So you're looking at about one, uh, 162 mm. for members. Mm -hmm. um, at, uh, I don't know, 170, 170 for members, uh, 170, 172. So that, that's roughly where it is. You've just got to dot the I's and cross a couple of T's on that uh, across yeah. the next couple of nights to lock that in. But um, that's roughly where I expect it will, will be. Uh, we're setting, but yeah, um, bit of fun. Yeah. I just like Yeah, uh, very, very cool. It just makes me happy. <laughs> Uh, and it's actually a, a beautiful looking uh, label that the team at Archie Rose have managed to do up for us and help us with taking a pretty crazy idea that we mm. had and taking that idea and we made it more complicated than it needed to be. Um, far, more far more complicated than it needed to be. <laughs> than, but um, yes, Amanda at the distillery, the design gun there has sort of pulled it off. And it's sort of, it's a, a sketch by um, one of the staff here, Blake, who has sort of inspired by an 1823 map of Sydney mm. um, and then sort of plotted where the Oak Barrel and Archie Rose uh, are in modern day but using that old sort of 1823 map and that was good for the 1823 map because mm. it doesn't have as much things on yeah. it to it'd be a very cluttered map uh, <laughs> if we did a 2020 version. Um, That's an interesting sort of concept for, for future labels as well. Yeah, well, I wanted to I wanted to create that sense of place because mm. we have a lot of time with Archie Rose. We love what they do. They're just up the road. Um, but as a, a few people are probably aware, Dave Withers is my predecessor here at the Oak Barrel. I, from when I was 18, 19 years old, I was sitting in the tasting room listening to Dave tell me about various types of whiskies and spirits from all over the world. And so when he was poached by Archie Rose to go across um, and start the distillery, he's been mm. distilling there since the start, 
Um, yeah, I, I uh, jumped out of the music industry and came here. So we have a lot of time. I, I wanted that to be a part of it. You know, when you look down on Sydney, if you know where they are, you can see the Oak Barrel. You can see Archie Rose. Mm. They're, like, they're proudly Sydney. We're, we're proudly Sydney. You know, from, from that point, part of the culture, we, we like to think we're all part of it. Um, so, yeah, a lot of a, a lot of great things that are... Um, happening, and I think that um, yeah, I think they nailed it. Um, and yeah, again, thank you for taking a, a complicated idea that we made very difficult in making it work. <laughs> We're good at that. Actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> taking uh, simple concepts and making them complicated. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, a quick day to, to Mark Teague as well, uh, who was a superstar. You might remember from the blind tasting that you were involved in, Joey. Uh, yeah, I do. I do remember actually picking bloody uh, painted Nantu, Nantu cast. Yeah. Jesus. Um, I, didn't, I didn't know what that distillery was before that tasting. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A quick g'day to Whiskey Wine Hustle, um, who uh, comments are enjoying the story mm. behind that behind that cask. Yeah. yeah. It is something that we looked at a couple of years ago, and we were going to do it last year, um, and it would have been like the second or third release of the ride, but mm. wouldn't have been a, we wouldn't have been able to get a cask like this at the time, and it was going to be rushed. We probably weren't going to give it the treatment it deserved. Um, yeah, we had a bit of time on our hands to think about things yeah. <laughs> during during lockdown. So I think we've, we've done it. Uh, I think, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty, as I said, I'm pretty proud of this one. Mm. I've been very, very lucky to be involved in a lot of great bottlings and single casts to here. But this is one that I, I'm just sitting back from everything from what it means to what it tastes and then seeing the, the physical product. Um, what I haven't seen is a lot of them next to each other, which I'm going to get to see tomorrow yeah, as well. Yeah, that'll be exciting. You know, there, there's, there's always an element of... <laughs> You know, I still get excited when a big order comes in and you see like 10 boxes of Glendronic and you go, yeah, okay, yeah. That, that's cool. Like, yeah. That's really cool. And one is seeing all those single casks lined up. Remember one of the last tastings, two nights before um, lockdown, we had the Four? Ben Riak oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. cast strength mm. batch two, which everyone who came to the tasting with Stu Buchanan got a cask of and just lining up. 50 of them just yeah. looks cool yeah. so that's the one thing I haven't seen yet is just all the car, all the bottles in a line that's the last thing I'm looking forward to seeing um, but yeah uh, we're going to try and live stream that as well from the distillery mm, that'll be cool yeah sounds difficult <laughs> yeah. but we'll again that. taking yeah. something very simple yeah, yeah, and making it. it as hard as we can yeah um, a question I did have about this as well is because it's something I think about a lot um, you know since Friday and trying to draw those ties between whiskey tasting wine tasting and all the rest and um everything else that's been going on with Forum. I've been sort of making um, translations in my head of, of between whiskey and wine and that sort of thing. So I, I think about with wines all the time is how and where and why would you drink a bottle of, you know, something? How and where and why would you drink this? Is there something that you're splashing around with mates, you know, at a barbecue or is it you know, one or two people quite intimately sitting by the fire, like something like that. Um, yeah, I, I think this is a this is a big whiskey. It's quite brooding. Um, mm. You know, the, some of the things that you uh, you know were talking about. Just it for you, it needs a bit of time to show its complexity. Mm. This is a bit of an occasion whiskey. Yeah, okay. Uh, for me, this, this is something that uh, old friends. Mm. You know, but it's a real conversation enhancer. Mm. You, you know what I mean, like. It's where you're settling in at night or around a fireplace or you know that you're going to be, you know, in that spot for a couple of hours. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, we, we're going to, inevitably, we don't know what we're going to talk about, but we're, we're, probably, going to be, the we're, we're probably going to be talking yeah. for a couple of hours just about whatever, whether mm -hmm. it's important stuff or just, you know, catching up. I think that's when I'd be like, okay, well, we're settling in. Let's, let's yeah, bring this yeah, out. Yeah. Whereas, you know, the Ben Rea feel like that. Is all about fun. It's almost the complete opposite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is that is a party whiskey. That's <laughs> like it is. It's a rum cask. It's got that sprightliness to it. It's, um, you know, it's a bit all over the place. I think there's probably slightly more going on than in this. Mm. But what you were saying, you know, cluttered and messy and all out of place. Mm. Yeah, hundred percent. And the, but that's what the Ben Rayek is. That one there in that case for me is, are hey, you just having a quick one or you know someone pops in the store? Oh, yeah. you know, we just have a quick try one. this. Yeah. Try this. Yeah, yeah. 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 So that's that's how I would. Start. I haven't actually thought about that, but that's where I'd put them. Yeah. Well, is it because I think the conversation we we're having the other day, um, I was it. It w w might have been this, or it might have been something else that we were talking about. Um, I was saying with the absence of absence of fair, um, you were like we always saw those ones that did quite well at fair, um, purchase wise. Were those ones that were massive and huge and stood out because. If you're in a room with 80 odd whiskies or something like that, and you're, yeah, you're higher, um, and you know, you're trying to hit 
uh, you know, more like more than a few, um, often the softer, more subtle expressions that are often very, very good whiskies, they do get lost in yes. those larger scale events. And um, you, like I know I've saw whiskies that I really, really enjoyed and thought were very good and often the higher price point, well, that sort of thing, um, just kind of get skipped over, I guess, from a consumer perspective. Whereas, you know, those big, huge, uh, heavy peat, heavy sherry, high ABV, that sort of thing, they often leave an impression on the palate at those events that even at, like, at the end of it, you're kind of like, oh, I still remember that kind of thing. And that might drive the, the purchasing decision. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think it's, it's tough. And it's, I know people even are aware of that. Mm. And they try and go, okay, I'm going to try the delicate stuff first, go you know, back to stuff and give it heaps of time and heaps of patience. But inevitably... In a room when people are shouting, whoever's shouting the loudest is going to be heard. Exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's it. But, you know, it still is a big whiskey, you know. It's mm. 50, I forget exactly, 50-something percent, um, uh, the, the Ben Riac. It's, and it's not a, um, you know, it's not a subtle whiskey by mm. any stretch of the imagination. And, you know, I think that it might have been this we were talking about. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's, um, it's fun. So, yeah, I think that this would almost, I think this is almost a little bit too... Uh, you know, too much velvet hammer. Mm. The power is quite subtle mm. in this, so um, I think it would actually not show as well as something crazy like the Ben Riak would at, at the fair. Yeah. Um, but if you bottle a single cast for fair, it's going to sell because it's going to sell type yeah. things. I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't think it is. But yeah, I think yeah, if if you had two versions of the exact same thing, something mm. that was a little bit more yelling and screaming than this one would probably uh, linger. Yeah, bit longer. absolutely. Which I think is what's going to make the next two nights quite amazing is having a, a like you know 30 plus 30 on the dot whiskey lovers in the same room being able to sit and just appreciate yeah you know rather than the, the hustle and bustle which is great too as well but um just different styles yeah 100%. um vanilla strat has come through on the instagram and said scotty rightly says to look to the future of whiskey rather than lamenting the past there's a great future whiskey moment archie xob yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm a big so fan. That, yeah, great comment. Um, and g'day to Chloe Wood from McLeodic as well on the Instagram there. Um, but that, that's a great point. That's something that we've always done. We um, we like to look to the future. Mm. Uh, and you know, you've seen it in all our releases. Uh, you know, That's a, a lot of what we've done in the past, and they're often informed by that. Yes, we do bottle some old stuff. You know, We bottled one of the last casts of the old Southern Coast Distillery. Um, you know, we, we bottled you know, a big you know, sherry... Um, but from Glendronach a few years ago, but that was from the modern era of Glendronach. Um, it's certainly what we're doing with Ben React. When we did the, I don't know if you remember the 97, the twin 97s, yep. which was a Ben Glen Nevis Rothes. and a Glen Rothes, yep. and they were very ugly, gritty, <laughs> diesel whiskey. I love those whiskeys, yeah. yeah. But that was almost a reaction to, you know, everything getting put into Australia and what the market was trying to drink then was all very pretty and very elegant and that sort of thing. Very clean mm. sherry casks, you know, very... Um, refined smoke and that thing was like nah let's buy the Ben Nevis so I guess do it um, so yeah I mean that is something that we try to do because otherwise you know there's an element of trying to make smart business decisions but there's also quite a strong element of getting bored yeah, and yeah. when we get bored <laughs> we tend to do silly things so um, yeah so when's the next wine you're bottling I want to see what that looks like yeah yeah we'll, we'll figure something out I think um, not a huge amount of breaks around this year though yeah as as I'm um, Sure, podcast um, listeners will find out that uh, there is a lot of good wine already being bottled. (laughs) And I'm just trying to keep up with it at the moment, Uh, let alone go and find some some more. That's slightly different. Like, if you go and buy a single cask of whiskey, and Mm. classic example is I just trusted, I didn't tell Dave what I wanted, Mm. I trusted that Dave would be able to pick something out awesome. He's done all the work. Is there an an element with wine, if you rock up to wine and said, hey, can we make an exclusive wine? I go, cool, what do you want? Then you have to make it. And, like, I, I think there's a real uh, benefit of having people who know what they're doing make yeah. products. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, I, I've... You've been in a few discussions here and there, nothing nothing too serious, but I've heard sort of stories of, of conversations going down that track of going, let's do an exclusive wine, one of this and that, um, and then proceeding with, well, yeah, and then six <laughs> weeks to eight weeks worth of very, very, very hard work, whether it be in the vineyard or the winery, um, to sort of get it to, to fruition. Um, which I wouldn't be, wouldn't be against, uh, but yeah, <laughs> we've got a bit more time on our hands. Yeah, um, but it has been a busy week in both whiskey and wine departments. It sounds sounds like hard work. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Um, spe- speaking of which, um, you know the, the worlds of wine and whiskey are always very interlocked when it comes from 
you know, particularly with barrels and that sort of thing, mm. and that's going to grow. So I should probably let you talk a bit about wine today, um, unfortunately. But, you know, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> After, you know, 10 nights of some pretty big whiskies, there is an element of me that wouldn't, you know, mind a little bit of fermented grape juice and maybe a bit of acid or a bit of citrus or yeah. something to, <laughs> to cut through. Um, yeah, I mean, we did... Um, I mean, I know I did um, on Friday night after the, the uh, society blind tasting, which was a lot of fun, uh, mind you, but uh, not as, as an experienced car strength whiskey drinker as, as probably some of the other people on the call there. Um, immediately went straight to the fridge and grabbed a bottle of Clare Valley Riesling <laughs> just for some freshness and some acidity to bring my palate back to life because trying to pick, was a 21 year old single cast Lafroy? Yeah, yeah, to, yeah. To yeah finish on? Just like, like ash. Yep, Glorious, think so. I think so. Beautiful, but just ash. Um, yeah, so I do, I do have a wine tonight. Um, a, a really, really fun little wine, and something I've been enjoying re- recently. But more to more to spur the conversation yeah. on on wine and what I've been doing recently. But I thought to um, to spur tradition a little bit. Uh, the very first oak barrel after hours was a wine from the great region of Orange out in Western New South Wales. Beautiful part of the world. I think we've done a couple more, and we've certainly mentioned it. Um, I, I don't think it counts as an after hours if Orange doesn't get a mention. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, I thought I'd, yeah, for the return, um, just to bring a, a fun little wine back. Um, this is a Pinot Gris from Nashdale Lane, uh, based out in Orange there. A really cool little producer that I've recently stumbled across. in the Valley for, for a little while now. Um, but, yeah, sort of trying to look all, all across Australia and, yeah, then come back to Orange and um, just come across it. And, again, it, Pinot Gris, uh, we all know it, or Pinot Grigio, it's, it's Italian uh, equivalent that we also make here in Australia. Um, really light, really approachable styles of wine. They can get quite serious and quite complex. Um, and they can also be really, you know, floral and, and fruit-driven Um Made in a, a variety of ways across the world, from uh, the really steely, acid-driven, intense um, uh, Pinot Gris from Alsace, the yeah, fresh, fruity uh, Italian ones, the, the variety we make here in Australia. Um, and I, I, I dare say, like, I reckon I've probably featured very, very few Pinot Gris. Um, yeah, I'm whether, sure. it, whether it be on the After Hours or whether it be in other virtual uh, content that, that we've produced in the last six months, it... I'm just trying to remember the last time I had a Pinot Gris full stop. Yeah. So that, so that, that was kind of it. And, I mean, without bad-mouthing it, like, a lot of the ones, a lot of, I guess, wineries that we see or something like that, they're really, really, really proud of their Pinot Noir or their Chardonnay or their Cabernet might be amazing. Or, you know, even they might do a Sauvignon Blanc in barrel and, and leave it on its lease for a while. Um, the sparkling might be great. It, I think it's very rare that you speak to a winemaker, you speak to a, a vineyard owner of, or operator or anything like that, that is really proud of their Pinot Gris. <laughs> like, and no, no, not in a bad way, but it's always like, oh, you know, we've got the Pinot, we've got the Chardonnay, we've got the Cabernet, and we've got a Pinot Gris planted out there as well, if, you know, you like that. It always, at least in the last sort of five years, has kind of been like that. You know, you either order it from the table because you're not going to offend anybody. Yeah. You know, you give it to someone that you don't know what they drink because Pinot Gris kind of goes either way. Some can be really wishy-washy and, you know, whatever. Um, they can be quite intense. The other... Well, actually, it was just... Yeah. So that's... Anyway, uh, so I tasted the, the Nashville Pinot Gris a few, few months ago. And I wouldn't say it was necessarily skipped over in the lineup or anything like that. But it was, you know, given as much attention as we give all the other wines when tasting... I just remember it really standing out. Yeah, okay. I think it was like a day that it spends on skins, not to give it any colour, but just to sort of bring out that texture. Um, all the notes and sort of all the, all the tasting notes and winemaking notes sort of read like, well, that actually, you know, we're, we're really looking at this in the wine and really giving it a, a go. Um, they should be certified organic this year as well, okay. Nashdale Lane, for, for out in Orange. Um, you know, a step that I always admire from any winery to... to Expensive and time-consuming. Expensive and time-consuming, and um, there's certainly a, a demand for organic wine, but, you know, I, I wouldn't say there's anyone really beating down the door to pressure them to become organic. Yeah. I think it's a decision that they've made, you know, on their own accord and, and good on them for it. Uh, the more organic wine we see coming out of Australia, the better. Um, but, yeah, I just remember really being quite take back, tasting it, really appreciate it, and since then I've kind of gone, yeah, I feel like a Pinot Gris. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a 2020 vintage. I can see it on the back here. Mm-hmm. Fresh, 
um, like almost like crunchy minerally on the nose, yeah. and then just really soft on the palate. Mm. Um, you know, obviously I like to use the word term soft on the palate across everything. It's <laughs> something I probably have used quite a bit. Um, but I, I do get that element from mm. this. Um, and just really, really sessionable. It's super pleasing, which yeah. I, I really like. You know, I, I do feel like there is an, like a, a, an expression of terroir in this as well. I do kind of get that, that cooler climate, that real sort of like... A mountain breeze, freshness towards it. It's acid driven. It feels quite lively. Does carry that sort of green apple, citrus fruit in there. Um, I think it's really nice. Mm. Aromatic and and it has a lot of depth to it as well. Uh, but it just it was it was one of those moments, and you you sort of have them every now and then. You sort of take them back and go, like, well, I don't know, drink more Pinot Gris. Yeah, and like, <laughs> why 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 does I mean we know why Chardonnay, mm. you know, the big eighties, early nineties, mm. big buttery really oaky sort of elements. South Australian, McLaren Vale, Barossa, Shiraz, mm. big spicy tannins. We we understand why people have sort of erred away from that mm. in recent times. What is it about Pinot Gris? Is it just, like, is it an unremarkableness or yeah. an unwillingness to experiment? Or like, what is... I don't... I, for a lot of... And we're talking, sorry, we're talking about classic ones here because a lot of, yeah. like, natural and minimal intervention wine yeah, makers really are cool still, stuff. like, and they yeah. haven't dropped off, but, like, that classic Pinot Gris mm. thing. Well, yeah, it's interesting, and sort of two points on that, I think that um, there was... There, there was, probably bigger than now, maybe it might not... Be, uh, might be bigger now, but I do think that there was an element um, coming through over the years that was that, uh, yeah... Typically un- unimpressive, relatively ordinary um, wines, you know, being made here in Australia, but also in Italy, there was coming over to just sort of fill a gap or fill a hole, which was, um, you know, I just need some cheap dry white wine. Can you can yeah, you get yeah. it for me? Like, and it just, does the grape go pretty robustly in a lot of different places? Pinot Gris? Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah ab- absolutely. But I think if, if you want to just really like sort of strip it down to its bare bones, just make it this kind of you know, whatever, kind of dry white wine, you can. And I think that that sort of took over its personality a little bit and demand for those wines um, definitely grew just, just because that's what people sort of loved. Um, yeah. We saw it in, uh, you know, we saw the same thing in Sauvignon Blanc a lot, but Sauvignon Blanc sort of went down a direction of, of aiming for a certain personality. I think Pinot Gris just went bland. Yeah, um, yeah. And, you know, there's still those expressions out there, which I think is why I, I was actually quite impressed by going, wow, like, you know, this has got character, it has soul towards it. Um, interesting as well about the natural winemaking comment that you made, um, where we do see a lot of, like, amazing skin contact Pinot Gris, a lot of Pinot Gris blends. Um, you know, some of, there's some amazing Pinot Gris grown in Alsace um, on these old rocky soils. Um, but I think that... A, because I, maybe Pinot Gris fruit wasn't as in demand, it is a cheaper option yeah, okay. than saying buying some incredible Chardonnay. So younger winemakers looking to get started out, looking to pr- push the boundaries a little bit, maybe take some Pinot Gris, maybe take some fruit that you can't get and like push it to its boundaries, really try and like, you know, drive the phenolics up, really try and drive the aroma up, extract the colour from the skin, see what happens. And then all of a sudden we're turning around and going... Well, that, you know, Pinot Gris that was left on skins for eight weeks and, you know, oxidised and all that sort of thing. It was really, really cool, really interesting. Sort of spikes a little bit. That's that's a really interesting thing about Pinot Gris I hadn't really had a, a thought about. And are we going to be sitting here in 10 years' time going, look at all those now, like, uh, for lack of a better word, famous or, like, really respected Australian winemakers... They started experimenting with Pinot Gris. Yeah. You know, and it's almost like the canvas that people can sort of play with. And because it's a, you know, potentially it's it's around, it's a little bit cheaper. If it doesn't go your way, it's not the end of the world. You know, yeah. it's a bit yeah, of a yeah. bit of an etch a sketch for, for weird uh, weird wine creations. I think yeah, that that's absolutely it. And then I think, you know, now a lot of wines that are more in demand, you know, those the the wine that we started after I was on, which was a base of Pinot Gris, yeah, it's blended with right. Riesling and Gewurz Traminer. You know, I mean, I'm not sh- sure what the Riesling and Gewurz Traminer element in that tasted like on its own, but it does feel as though it is this, almost in its own, it's this canvas for, okay, you've got your you've got your structure here, now let's throw in some Riesling for acid and um, a bit of texture, and then the Gewurz is going to bring up all this aromatic quality towards it, but it's flabby, so it needs to be this sort of thing. That's, that's I really just, interesting. It's a really like, interesting blending component. Yeah, I, like, I, I really like that. I mean, you have... In whiskey, some of the distilleries we don't hear about, the, the, the workhorse distilleries, 
they're like A grade blenders melt and B grade blenders melt and C grade and that sort of thing because we know that Linkwood just binds flavours and can be yeah. built upon. Awesome. Uh, you know, Ben Rinner's another great one. Manic Moore, another great uh, blenders malt. You know, would you consider Pinot Gris to be the equivalent of blenders love Pinot Gris? I wouldn't say that necessarily. Okay. Um, just because I don't... I don't think it's it quite works in that way of just like... You know, it's, I don't think it's a band-aid, if that makes sense. I don't think it's like a sort of a fixer or anything like that. Um... You know, I don't but think if you're gonna, yeah, I don't think if you're gonna make a great blend, you go and plant Pinot Gris. You know, you uh, I think okay, that okay. you kind of work with what you got. It just so happens that it works really well on these aromatic white blends. I mean, maybe if you were, if you were to set out and go, I want to make a really really good aromatic white blend, I would ash- think you would probably have some parcels on Pinot Gris if it suited the the, the two are. Yeah. Um, but yeah, again, it's almost like super pleasing. You know, it, uh, enough to keep me entertained and, and yeah. intrigued, and, and so that, that's how it's getting harder and harder to do. Um, um, just on that, then, um, you know, people are experimenting with with wine and maybe taking some varietals and doing things weirder things with them, or in the case of like the Nashda we're drinking here, just taking a grape and actually trying to to make it the best of what it can yeah. be. Do you see the future of that sort of experimentation and that playfulness coming in blends or in single varietal uh, expressions? I think I'm, I, it's sort of, I suppose it's really hey, good question from Fitzsimons. Yeah. I thought like that questions were done in the previous eight nights, but I'm glad I got that Honestly, one. Honestly, it, it really I think it depends on the winemaker. At the end of the day, because I, I think that it, it really depends on the risk that people are willing to take. You know, I think the the key example that I always think of is. Uh, so I just got alert, and just to prove we're live, uh, we're live. The Adelaide Crows have won a game of Australian Rules football in 2020. <laughs> Uh, by beating Hawthorne, that results just come in. Um, so, uh, if you're an Adelaide Crows fan, congratulations. But also, you're still an Adelaide Crows fan when you wake up tomorrow. But please continue. Yeah. So you'll, you'll learn a real sport one day. Um, but no, like the key example I always I always sort of look at is, and you know, there's always debate on, on whether it's really wine or anything like that. But it's Sam Smith from VHS. Um, I know one of his wines came through in the first, I think probably the first time I ever tasted the variety was um, the, um, the uh, number two, I can't remember, it was, uh, not Intermission, there were, there was, it was releasing a series of wines, you had one, two, three, four, five, um, number two was Slankamina Bella. Yep. Yeah. yeah that's, that's, yep, I don't, yeah, know what that is. Yeah. And I had heard of the variety, I'd never tried it before, I didn't even know he had it in Australia. I um, mean, it was straight Slankamina Bella, I think it had some sort of crazy infusion that he put where there was tobacco smoke it was aged in something weird it was um acidified with something. it was it was crazy but i just remember going like i've never seen a straight slunk of no. and i still haven't yeah, <laughs> yeah, really, yeah. i know it's down there but i still haven't seen it and yeah maybe it does the portion of that does go to blends but it's either your big risk takers like that that are willing to go and bottle a straight slunk of bella and put it onto the market or is it, let's just test the waters here. Yeah, I see a lot of people now um, blending things with Nebbiolo, blending things with Barbera, maybe not necessarily releasing a straight Nebbiolo or a straight Barbera, but they are willing to trial it in with um, things like Pinot and Shiraz and that kind of thing. Um, just using it for maybe it's more prominent aromatic or structural uh, components to bring up maybe a wine they're more used to making. So say, oh, I, really, I know the Shiraz really well, but we're just gonna have a little bit of Barbera for, for fruit. Or something like that. So it's gonna. I think it's gonna be a combination of the two. Yeah, I would love to see. We are. Um, we're bringing after hours back to, to fill a gap here in Sydney Whiskey Forum, um, but we all also are launching our new podcast uh, tonight, which we recorded just before coming live here. We might take some snippets from this as well. But I think there's real scope for you to like as these new alternative, or what we call alternative varietals, mm. come through. It's just like little podcast episodes based on. That wine, who's yeah. on the plate like that, but like, and just like talk about that specific grape because I think that's fascinating. Going into um, that that sort of world and just going, hey, where did this grape come from? How did it get to Australia, mm. and how are they using it? Yeah, and what does that mean for the wine in your glass? I think I think it's fascinating. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely no use to you on that podcast, <laughs> but I'll I'll press the record button and wind you off. I think. Um, um, as part of a series of stuff we're going to be doing. The interesting thing as well that I actually had this conversation this morning. Let me see if I can 
Um, so that was a way too long time ago. A couple, couple of questions coming through. Oh, just comments here on the Instagram. Mm. I can see Paul Hovey says, my favourite one. I think he's talking about that VHS. Yeah. Uh, and Pete... Um, like, Amato Vino, yeah. So Amato Vino do, do make it over in Margaret River there as well. Yeah, okay. uh, But I haven't tried it. Yeah. I tried their Trusto, though. It's very good. Well, mate, get, get your act together. And what have you been doing all week? Apart uh, from when the Oak Rail trying... was flying me over the Margaret River. Yeah. And... <laughs> we only trying, like, the, the 50 new wines in store today, yeah. whatever it is. Um, um, the other reason that I chose this as well was because I had a really interesting um, conversation this morning about, you know, in the the... the, the Word that can't be mentioned, the 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 C word, the C O V I D word. Ah, uh, yep, yep. Um, when that kicked in <laughs> earlier this year, um, we did notice. I'd, I'd say a, a somewhat dramatic shift in in buying patterns yeah, from I from customers so. in store and stuff like that. And I'd say almost across the board, um, you know, that willing or that average bottle spend, I think, dropped quite a lot. Um, and there was different variety to variety. I mean, I know. That that you know thirty or forty dollar bottle of Shiraz turned quite quickly into a twenty dollar bottle of Shiraz. Yeah, and yeah, that, yeah. Um, Same with, with the Pinot and, and Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay, all that sort of thing. It definitely it went down a little bit. I don't know why, and I did run the figures on this the other day. Pinot Gris went up. Is it because it's Old Faithful? Because I know what I'm going to get in these trying times. I need at least one thing to be stable in my I th- life. I, I think so. So we were trying to we we're trying to figure out because I don't know why, but for whatever reason, you know, Pinot Gris that we sold here through the shop anyway, and like outside of those probably more exotic natural expressions, you you run of the mill Pinot Gris and Pinot Grigios. Um, it was always like a, a sort of a fifteen, maybe a twenty twenty five dollars spend at the best time. We did have Pinot Gris over that price point. Didn't really move since then. We've moved a lot more Pinot Gris in that sort of $30, $40, $45 price point. Maybe it's that Old Faithful thing. Um, but I also think maybe the, 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 maybe people aren't drinking those bottles at restaurants anymore or, or what it is. Uh, but a really interesting observation that I had. Yeah, yeah. It is, yeah. It's quite fascinating. You know, again, we are in a great case study. Uh, I'm going to look back on 2020 and see what happened and how people reacted and you know, for, for the next time. Um, so be, I think all those sorts of things are, are playing out. And the fact is, we're still co- collecting that data. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. You know, we're still learning the lessons of what's going on. I know in spirits, we saw similar sort of thing. It was a lot of um, short things, not as much experimentation mm. um, across the, the bottles that were being bought. Like, you're weird and wonderful. Uh, maybe I'll wait. I'll go with something I'm, I'm guaranteed to know I'm going to love. And certainly the value mark. But I also saw the top end as well mm. so that middle swathe that sort of like you did the 130 dollar purchase turned into a 91 yeah, pretty much yeah. overnight that's the 100 dollar purchase became a 60 dollar purchase yeah. that's what that was but then you know up to you know bottles that you know get close to four figures people seem to be sitting at home going mm. if i'm i've been saving up for it or it's been on my radar yeah i can afford it but it's a you know 800 dollar bottle of whiskey so mm. you can't do that every day we went, yeah, screw it. It's, you know, yeah. I'm stuck at home. I'm going to pull the trigger. So there was a little bit of that as well, which was quite interesting. Do you think that's like the, you know, maybe the, the holiday Italy is being cancelled or something like I that? Think, I think there was a bit of that yeah, as well. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, was, I was meant to be in Scotland or Japan right now. Yeah. So, you know, so I'm, just, I'm dragging it to me. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, but, and I think that's, that's the thing. There's everyone was in a different position. Everyone's mm. reacting a bit differently. So it's hard to make, you know, too overtly general uh, Yeah. Statements about everything. Um, um, we are about an hour into this uh, tonight, so just beware. Instagram I think we're about five off. minutes away from Instagram yeah. saying you're done. Um, we did actually have a question come through from Vanilla Strat, which says, what's the next exciting white grape variety in Oz that producers are doing cool things with? Um, which is, yeah, it's, it's, that's a pretty loaded question as well, I think. Um, I'd say there are a few safer bets in terms of, I mean, doing cool things with... Uh, I like the uh, tail end of that. Um, so it leads me to say things like Shannon. Um, yep. I, think I like that. I like that really, answer. Really, really, really cool things with Shannon from, um, you know, James Erskine has been doing it for years and his Shannon's are, are, are amazing too. Um, the stuff from, from Rob and Jen out of Carimbia in the Swan Valley, we, we had them on a stream uh, last week. Um, and last the week before last. Um, and their, their Shannon are like very different to maybe some of the quirky, more nat- more minimal interventionist styles. Still very minimal interventionist in their own right, uh, but really precise, really clean, um, but also changing a lot, um, a lot to give. Um, 
I was going to say, well, like, which one would probably we'll see more of and grow the most. Um, there are the easier bets to go, say things like Vermentino. I think we'll see a bit more Fiano, um, Video. Yeah, let's see more oh, Fiano. Videlo can make a comeback um, if they're done right. Again, I think a lot of these varieties, especially like Videlo from out of the Hunter, maybe lost its its grip on the market a little bit with this sort of uninventive, maybe unimpressive expressions that came through. It tended to be a bit bit light on and not too interesting. Um, but yeah, I would love to see um, Malvasia. I'd love to see a Rinto. Um, you know, these ones are, I'd say, a little bit further off, but uh, again, yeah, some Alvarino would be really, really cool. Um, Gruna Veltliner, and there's a bit of that coming around as well. Um, those I don't think will be as popular, but equally as exciting. Yeah, well, I mean, that's um, that's something exciting to look forward to. And, you know, as we were saying on the podcast we recorded just before coming live here, it's spring. It's day yeah. one of spring. Summer's around the corner. Summer gets earlier and earlier. So, you know, arguably people who, are, who tend to be quite seasonal in their drinking habits might be reaching for these whites a little bit earlier this, this year. I mean, yeah, yeah, I think so. Point. And as we, like, we were sort of discussing on the podcast, not to take too much away from um, that listening experience, but I think it's going to be a combination of, A, the consumer maybe wanting to give things a go, but also um, people like you and I that are like, hey, try this. Give this a go, like, um, you know, try, like, give it, like, we've had, seen success, we've done the Charmers Vermentino on here before, and that's one of those bottles where it's like, give it a go, see how it is, and then almost 100% success rate on um, people coming back and either telling us how much they enjoyed it or buying a few more bottles or anything like that, so yeah. Awesome, well, I mean, right. uh, we might we might wrap up on the, on the Facebook shortly, because um, we, we've hit that hour mark. Um, Joey, thank you for joining me tonight. As a, as a late ring in, probably a week earlier, then we're going to kick after hours back off and bring in the energy levels uh, because it, it has been a, a long week. Um, cannot wait for tomorrow to get in uh, in a room with other whiskey lovers and drink a bit of whiskey at Archie Rose Distillery. It's such a beautiful place. Um, we'll be drinking, uh, launching the new Archie Rose single cast that we previewed uh, earlier tonight. Uh, so that's going to be a lot of fun uh, for the, the wrap-up night of Sydney Whiskey Forum 2020. Um, and thank you... Uh, yeah, for, for doing that, and, uh, and thank you everyone for, for watching. And we, we might go live uh, back again on, on the Instagram, but we might wrap it up there on, on Facebook. Uh, final thoughts from you? Um, yeah, not bad. Yeah, not, not bad. Not bad, this, this, this Rosebury Distillery I've not heard a little bit little about. Drop. The kids yeah. are all right, I think. The kids yeah. are all right. That's my hot tip for 2021. Australian whiskey. Australian whiskey. Could be, could be popular. Yeah, invest in it yeah, yeah, yeah. 20 years ago. <laughs> um, <laughs> All right, guys. We were again. Thank you. Thank you for uh, uh, your questions and your comments and everything. As uh, always, it's very, very much appreciated. Um, and it's always nice to do this with other people because we would be doing this by ourselves, uh, regardless if you guys weren't here. Um, anyway, so but yes, for those of you we're going to see across the next two nights, we are looking forward to that immensely. Um, but this is going to keep rolling. We'll, we'll see you each week. And um, yeah, thank you for joining us for the podcast launch. Uh, and we should have further details of uh, one that is polished up into something resembling something that someone who knows what they're doing had a hand in, uh, which is definitely not us. We, uh, someone else, a professional, we're going to, uh, to get involved. But thank you all, uh, and we will see you very soon. See you then.